Hmm. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, give it a big old thumbs up. Give it a little comment. Give it a little subscription, man. They really need it. I thank you for watching. And this is the last of the series, so let's get into it. The arm has a space in the shoulder girdle. Its one bone, called the humerus, is cylindrical, slightly curved, with a spherical head fitting into the cup-shaped cavity of the shoulder blade. Its ball and socket joint is covered with a lubricating capsule and held together by strong braces of membranes and ligaments. These, crossing at different angles, brace the arm as well as allow great freedom of movement. The lower part of the arm ends at the elbow and a hinge joint, on the inner and outer sides of which are two prominences called inner and outer condyles. Both prominences show on the surface. The inner condyle is used as a point of measurement and is more conspicuous than the outer one. The forearm has two bones. One called the ulna is notched to fit around the rounded surface between two condyles of the arm at the elbow. The extremity of the lower end of the shaft has the shape of a knob which shows plainly above the wrist on the little finger side. The outer bone, called the radius, joins the wrist on the thumb side of the hand. Here it is wide, curving upward to its head, which is small and cup-shaped, a ring of ligament holding it in place below the outer condyle of the arm bone, or humerus. The radius, on the thumb side of the wrist, radiates around the ulna on the little finger side, at the elbow. The arm and forearm act as a hinged joint. The mass of the shoulder descends as a wedge, sinking into the flattened outer arm halfway down. At this point, from the front, the arm wedges downward to enter the forearm below the elbow. When the thumb is turned away from the body, the mass of the forearm is oval, becoming round when the bones of the forearms cross. The mass corresponding to the wrist is twice as wide as is thick and enters the forearm halfway up, as a flattened wedge. From the back of the shoulder enters the arm on the side. Beneath it, there is a truncated wedge from the center of which, in a line from elbow to shoulder, is the plane of the tendon of the elbow. The forearm is rounded or oval, depending upon whether or not the bones of the forearm are crossed, and the wrist is twice as wide as it is thick. So as you can tell by the text, uh, it's a little analytical as far as, you know, trying to look at it from an artistic standpoint, but I'm going to try to decipher what I'm doing here. So right here I'm doing the distribution of masses, um, round, square, round, square, and then I'm, I'm just building and refining and adding uh, shadows and um, just looking at what George is doing and uh, trying to get an idea of what he's thinking. So this is definitely the distribution of masses. And here I'm just creating a, uh, some, some kind of you know, uh, concave in the, where the the muscle goes in and now here I'm getting a little looser and this is the rhythm this is where the the rhythm comes in and uh, if, if you look at my second video it, there's like exercises that I'm doing where I'm, I'm drawing a rhythmic exercises a rhythmic uh, structures rhythmic drawings and it helps me do, do something like that second drawing now here I'm building uh, using the distribution of masses, so you got square, round, square, round, square, round, square, and then connecting these and giving it three three dimensions on a two dimensional surface. And here again, I'm going in with the arm and uh, building it from the wireframe, and then just building the muscle around it. <clears throat> and here I am uh, 
going in with the the shading and this is the elbow and then the lower part of the the arm and just remember that the the elbow goes connects to the the wrist of the pinky and uh, so there's definitely a lots lots of examples simple examples and here I'm just trying to build using a three dimension and then growing with that and you know trying to understand what the arm is and how it how it applies to the drawing itself <clears throat> and here's another example and here I'm getting more arithmetic with my my chalk and uh, just going in and just trying to understand what George is trying to explain and I would like to tell tell you right now that uh, I really appreciate all the views all the support all the subscriptions uh, this is the last video of the series and it's taken me a while to put this out because uh, you kind of get a little burned out you know doing these and but the response has been incredible and I should be doing more but this is the last one and um, it's been a journey it really has I mean I, I really didn't expect to go this far with these but they're coming along great and I'm really enjoying them and so here I'm, I'm like I said before I'm, I'm building um, distribution of masses uh, rhythm um, wedging passing locking and trying to make something out of nothing and uh, so now I'm just going in and looking at what George has done <clears throat> And that, that that part right there, it's it seems to be like a wedge where the, the bicep starts and then hit, you hit the elbow. And now this one, it's getting a little more organic from, from what I was, I did the first one I did. And there, I'm going in, uh, rounding it off, squaring it off, shading. And um, just remember two shades it's all George needs is two shades. So I think that's it with the arms. Let's see what's next. The bones of the wrist are mortized with those of the hand, making one mass. The hand moving with the wrist. The width of the wrist is twice its thickness, and where it joins the arm, it diminishes in both width and thickness. There is always a step down from the back of the arm, over the wrist, to the hand. The wrist moves with the hand on the forearm, and in combination with these are some rotary movement, but no twisting movement. The twisting movement is accomplished by the forearm. The hand has two masses, that of the hand proper and that of the thumb. The first of these masses is beveled from knuckles to wrist on the edge, from wrist to knuckles on the flat side, and from first to little finger from side to side. It is slowly arched across the back. The knuckles are somewhat more arched. They are concentric around the base of the thumb, the second knuckle larger and higher than the rest, the first knuckle lower on its thumb side, where it has an overhang, as has the knuckle of the little finger, due to their exposed positions. On the little finger side, the form of the hand is given by the abductor muscle and the overhang of the knuckle, by which the curve of that side is carried well up to the middle of the first segment of the little finger, on the back of the hand nearly flat except in the clenched fist. The tendons of the long extensors are superficial and may have raised sharply under the skin. The hand has four primal uses, weapon, scoop, hook, thongs. So I really thought this was the coolest part of the hand exercises is the weapon. And here I'm drawing the hand as a weapon. And the weapon is a sphere with a blade. Uh, and then 
it's showing me how the hand can be interpreted as a, a weapon in a clenched fist, closed fist, closed hand. And it's, it's really, it's really a simple, a simple little exercise, a little simple uh, theory and it, it works. And I'm, I'm, I really like the simplicity of the, the exercise. <clears throat> so that is the weapon. And now I'm going to be drawing a scoop. And it's an interesting scoop, <laughs> um, but it's definitely a great example uh, to start from to draw the hands in the scoop position because I guess, you know, the hands can be used as a scoop to scoop things. I mean, uh, the hand is a very important, intricate part of our anatomy. And <clears throat> I'm just taking examples that Georgia did and, and copying them, trying to learn them. And, and hopefully you're, you're drawing along with me. You know, um, there is there is always books out there on George's anatomy. <clears throat> and <clears throat> these are are always out there. They'll always be out there to the end of time. And, and, and just remember, all roads lead to Bridgman. All the, the anatomy books, the anatomy lessons, they all lead back to, to pretty much this. And <clears throat> so now I'm just uh, exercising my scoop hands. And I'm going to be... thumb, the mass around the thumb, and then fingers, first finger, and then, I think that was it, yeah, and now I'm, I'm drawing the thumb with closing fingers to represent the scooping, scooping motion. Let me draw some fingernails in there. Just to give it some, some view of what the finger is. And now this would be the hook. This is our hook. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so that's the wrist and where the, the wrist and hand meet and it, it, there's like a hook. Hook, yeah. And as you can see, there's a certain way that I draw the way that I hold the chalk. And here I'm using I'm just vine, just vine, fine chalk, vine charcoal on on newsprint. And here I'm just just practicing where the wrist meets in the joint of the hand, and how it is turning into a hook. All right, and then the last one is um, trying to guess here. This is a tongue, the tongue. The hand is a tongue. There's my thumb, 
There's like the connecting sinew of the thumb, connecting to the first finger, and trying to emulate the thong pretty much. You know. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I, I hope you're enjoying these as much as I enjoy making them. I hope they help you in your artistic journey and in, in your in your learning of anatomy. And I, I've certainly learned a lot. And it's definitely definitely helping me. And I'm. Sometimes I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how fast I'm doing these. But with time and practice, you can draw just as fast as I am. And learning and growing, you know, I'm always growing. Always always learn, always grow, no matter how, how old you are. All right, let's see here. Again, with the thong, the bending, the arching of the that mass, that wedge mass of your hand where your, your palm is, and then taking that and extending it with the knuckles to the finger, learning about fingers and knuckles and the sinew and all that good stuff, you know. But hands are definitely the hardest part. The hardest part of the anatomy that it, it, it is to draw convincingly, and it just takes practice. You know, draw draw your own hand, draw other people's hands. You know, um, but hands are definitely the hardest to master. But once you do it, it's it's definitely a weapon in your toolbox uh, to to add into your drawings <clears throat> and a lot of people a lot of people they judge you by how you draw your hands so you must definitely try to embrace it uh, and master it there are three bones in each of the four fingers called Phalanges and or soldiers. Each phalanx turns on the one above and leaves the end of the higher bone exposed. There are no muscles below the knuckles, but tendons traverse the fingers on the backs and tendons and pads over the fronts. The longest and largest finger is the middle finger. In the collapsed hand, it is opposite the thumb and with it bears the chief burden. For the opposite reason, the little finger is smallest and shortest and most freely movable. The bones of the body are narrower in the shaft than it at either end, and this is especially true of the fingers. The joints are square, the shafts also are square, but smaller and with rounded edges. The tips are triangular, the middle joint of each finger is the largest. The masses of these segments are not placed end to end as on a dead center, either in profile or in back view. In the back view, the fingers as a whole arch towards the middle finger. In the profile view, there is a step down from each segment to the one beyond, bridged by a wedge. pelvic girdle or basin is in two pieces with a bindle keystone called the sacrum. At the back upon this keystone rests the spine. The lower limbs articulate from each side, causing the basin to tilt or rock with a rotary or churning movement. To allow this range of movement, the lower limbs have a ball and socket joint. 
The joint of the shoulder and that of the hips are both ball and socket joints, and they differ in form only so far as the movements executed by the upper and lower limbs differ. The cup in the joint of the shoulder blade is shallow. The socket into which the thigh bone fits is deeper and more solid. This is so because the mechanism pertaining to movement of the lower limbs is designed to carry weight, for the lower limbs are supporting columns as well as means of locomotion. They are firmness as well as action. The thigh bone ends at the knee as a hinge joint, the leg requiring only a backward and forward motion for which a hinge joint is sufficient. However, the joint at the knee is not formed as if by a bolt passing through the two parts of a hinge. Instead, the upper portion of the leg bone passes, or glides, under the lower end of the thigh bone. These are held in place by ligaments and sheathed with a membrane. In this manner, the ends of the bones are held together as they rock the relative convexities and shallow concavities. diminishes in thickness as it descends to the foot. From any view, it also has a reverse cut that extends its entire length. On either side, a descending wedge overlaps the rounded form of the thighs, and this again overlaps the square form above and below the knee joint, which is also square. The leg at the calf is triangular. At the ankle, it is square. Think of the knee as a square with sides beveled forward slightly hollowed in back and carrying the kneecap in front. When the knee is straight, its bursa or water mattress forms a bulge on either side in the corner between the cap and its tendon, exactly opposite the joint itself. The kneecap is always above the level of the joint. The back of the knee, when bent, is hollowed by the hamstring tendons on either side. When straight, the bone becomes prominent between them, making with these tendons, three knobs. The inside of the knee is larger, and the knee as a whole is bent convex toward its fellow. The hip socket, the knee, and the ankle are all in line with the leg is straight, but the shaft of the thigh bone is carried some distance out by a long neck, so that the thigh is set at an angle with the leg.
two bones of the leg, called the tibia and the fibula, extend from the knee to the ankle. The lower ends of these bones project so as to form the inner and outer ankles, respectively, where they receive the articulating joint of the foot, the astragalus. The foot rolls under the leg bones. It is arched, and at each end of the arch it is buttressed either by heel or large toe. The keystone of this arch is not fixed. It moves freely between the two bones of the leg. The heel is on the outside of the foot, the ball of the large toe on the out inside, giving it a rotary and a transverse movement crossing the already mentioned horizontal arch. The bones of the foot are wedged together and bound by ligaments, giving resistance, solidity, and elasticity. So as uh, we were working on this foot here, I just want to say thank you to all my subscribers, all my viewers. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do, because it really helps me grow as a small YouTube creator. And this is the last of the George Bridgman study nights. And I hope that you can come back again and again and watch these and learn from them and, and, and just have a good time and draw and, and be, be merry and be blessed and just fill your sketchbooks up with amazing art. And again, I just want to thank you for everything. These George Bridgman videos have really excelled me and have really put me into the algorithm. So thank you again. Bless you and have a good night.